This is an ABC News special report. Hello again, everybody, and for those of you joining us now who uh, I cannot imagine under any circumstances expected to see a normal World News Tonight broadcast at this time. We've been on the air for the last 10 hours as the country has endured uh, or is trying to, uh, to get through, as one official here in New York said, this horrendous attack on the United States today in both New York City and outside Washington at the Pentagon, and an attack that may or may not have gone wrong on Camp David in Maryland, the president's country retreat, but certainly resulted in the deaths of some people on yet another airliner today. Uh, so this is going to be a very different broadcast and try to deal in the next half hour as we have deal with today in a comprehensive way um, exactly what the United States has been through today. It began a little more than 10 hours, a little less than 10 hours ago, and first one aircraft, we'll take you through the, the video scenes of the day, um, when first one aircraft and then another hit and ultimately destroyed the twin one, trade towers 110 stories high on the west side of Manhattan. We didn't see the first one happen even though television was on and that is the astonishing second one as seen by a freelance cameraman who joined us a short while ago um, and he then stayed on to record this extraordinary, which we've seen from many angles, collapse to first one of the Trade Towers and then of the other. And the attack uh, brought down these two towers upon themselves, ultimately, and has left this extraordinary pile of rubble, video brought to us from yet another person. Meanwhile, um, we have this crash at the Pentagon, 200 feet wide, concern at the White House, Obviously, the president was in Florida early today, but then particularly when word that a fourth plane had been hijacked, which ultimately crashed in the Pennsylvania countryside outside Johnstown, Pennsylvania, not far from Pittsburgh. The president of the United States has spent part of this day in an underground bunker in Nebraska. Uh, he's on his way back uh, to Washington now. He's going to speak to the nation tonight. Uh, the Navy's Atlantic fleet was at one point diverted to come and bring aircraft carriers to New York Harbor so that they could assist. There's, there's help and assistance uh, descending on New York and Washington from a variety of places. And, and it's probably not at all unfair to say that the entire country is, in some measure, in shock uh, as to what has happened uh, to the United States in a psychological, symbolic, and very physical way uh, on this uh, particular day. In this half hour, we're going to try to um, put together um, just some of the more cogent reporting of our reporters who've been watching this throughout the day. And I want to go first to ABC's Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day, gathering what she can. Diane. All right, Peter, forgive me if I don't respond to you carefully, because it's still very noisy down here, and I'm going to kind of tell you what happened to me. We're now about four blocks from the scene, and as you can see, even at this hour, it's like being on the edge of the crater of a volcano. The smoke is still pouring out. The air is still acrid with fumes. Everywhere around me, I see haggard firefighters, exhausted policemen. And then in this eerie disconnect in New York, occasionally you see people just succumbing to the everyday and walking by. But still, if when you look at this, it is clear it is not over because, as we know, within the last hour, another building came down, number 47, a 47-story building. And also, they're saying they're evacuating now the Millennium Hotel, so this may not be over in a number of ways. As I said, when you walk around the streets of New York, and it's too easy probably to say that it's like one of those techno future thrillers where everything seems wrong, and yet people are carrying packages. They've been shopping while firefighters are still streaking their way down here. I also want to bring in, if I can, Don Daler, Peter, because Don has been down here all day. He was with us this morning as well. And about an hour ago, you made your way up to the scene, and you've had those pictures from, from the private photographer, Peter, but I want Don to tell us what he saw when he went to the scene himself. Right, well, about an hour ago, we made our way down Broadway, past where there were a large number of firemen gathered, very frustrated, very exhausted, because they were not being allowed to put out these fires in the number of the buildings around the, the site of the World Trade Center itself. There was too much danger for them to be going there. They wanted to go and work. We made our way past the firemen and got about half a block away from where this building on this side would have been standing. And there was billowing smoke. It was hard to see everything, but I clearly saw 
something worse than I, what Dante would have imagined. There was, there was rubble, there was twisted metal, and I clearly saw bodies and what appeared to be body parts strewn on the street, on the, on the rubble itself. And people still working on the evacuations? Working on evacuations. Yes, but, but they were forcing at the point I was there, the police were forcing everyone uh, from emergency workers to the firemen away because there was such a fear, as you saw later, of, of a building collapse. Well, I want to give you a sense again, Peter, of what it is like here when one of the buildings collapse. We have here Jeff Rosson, who's from WABC, our affiliate, which has done great work today on this story. And Jeff, we have footage, and I hope we can cue it up, because we see this wall, this thunderous wall of smoke streaking down the street, and you were just ahead of it. And for all of you who were trying to escape it, what was that like? Well, what happened was we saw this big cloud coming at us. It was dust and it was smoke, and we knew the people inside of it couldn't see anything because we saw them running at us. So our job was to just get out of the way. What happened was we couldn't get out of the way fast enough, and it caught up with us. We have people crying. They were creating a human chain, literally walking around like this because they couldn't see anything. At one point, we were stuck. We were at a store with a glass front, and we couldn't get in. There was no way to go. We couldn't breathe. We didn't have masks. So an officer, a police officer from New York, came in with an ax and literally just bashed in the window and led us into that store. If it wasn't for that, I'm not sure what we would have done. And that's been a huge problem all day. Couldn't just see anything, and that was the problem. What was the heat like, and how suffocating was it for those trying to escape? It was hot, but luckily we were a couple of blocks away, and, and the bigger problem was all the dust. And it got into your lungs, and you just kept coughing, and you couldn't speak, and you couldn't see. That, I mean, you kept, people were walking at the poles. People were crying and screaming. It was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. Well, again, these are just a couple of people who have been on the scene all day, Peter. And as we said, we have watched this footage. We have seen people both heroic, terrified, and mystified. And the scene out here tonight is really just one of complete, almost wounded numbness. And there's no other phrase I can summon at this moment to convey it to you. Thank you very much, Diane. Diane Sawyer, who's been in Midtown Manhattan all day trying to get a grasp of the city and, and very effectively what's going on around her. Don Daler from ABC News, Good Morning America, has been down uh, with a couple of freelance photographers. It's freelance photographers who brought us uh, the, most, uh, the most intimate, the closest up video of what actually happened at the Twin Trade Towers today. It's a reminder of the world we live in. There's a camera pointed by somebody almost everywhere. Catch you up very quickly on a story to say again what we said before World News Tonight came on, which that U.S. officials speaking for some reasons on the conditions of anonymity say the United States is not involved in any of the violence going on in Kabul, the Afghanistan capital tonight. This appears to be an intra-Afghan affair that the, that the supporters of a, of a leading anti-Taliban leader who was killed the other day have been rocketing the city tonight so it has nothing as best we can tell uh, to do with this and then of course there was the pentagon and it just think back ten hours it just began to pile up on us one thing after the other one was horrible the next was third horrible by the time the pentagon attacked shortly after the attack on the twin trade towers it was amazing and here's abc's john mccrethy who's been there all day john Peter, it was at 9.38 this morning. I was innocently sitting in my office at the Pentagon when there was a jolting blast on the other side of the building. You can see it over my shoulder. Uh, a large aircraft came down 395, which is a major highway. It clipped off the tops of many of the light poles on the way in, and it slammed into the building. Uh, you can see on the one side of the huge gash uh, that windows, 25 windows down along the Pentagon were destroyed. Uh, the building, the section of the building that was hit by the fuselage of the aircraft collapsed several minutes after the aircraft hit it. Um, I was able to get an exclusive walk up to the damage site uh, with some officials who got me through police lines. Uh, the area is uh, surrounded with police evidence. Uh, uh, markings all over. There was a huge area for medical triage uh, that is quiet now. And now they are continuing to fight fires inside the building, Peter, so they can go ahead and try and get anyone who may be still trapped in the rubble. It took them five hours before they were able to get into the building initially and begin to look for people who might be trapped and injured. John, we heard a while ago, and there's some chaos here too, as you can understand, about, the ca about a preliminary casualty figure at the Pentagon. Do you feel you have a good handle on that? 
I do not have a good handle on it, Peter. There have been wild rumors from several hundred to over a thousand. It's impossible to know at this point, uh, and I will not speculate. And you may have said this most recently, uh, and we would never want you to speculate, John. Um, we, we believe, I believe you said now what you said earlier before, that the senior military officials of the Pentagon, none of them have been hurt to the best of your knowledge. Don Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, is in just a few minutes going to hold a briefing inside the Pentagon for a very few number of reporters that are over there. Um, and all of the military chiefs have been accounted for, and they have been spending the day in the National Military Command Center. Presumably, they have initially been looking at rescue uh, options, but we also believe they are looking at retaliation options. But before that can happen, of course, the United States has to determine who they believe is responsible for this attack. I'll tell you, Peter, there is a pervasive sense of anger among the military officers I've talked to today. They have mentioned again and again Pearl Harbor, saying that it is going to be dwarfed, the number of people killed in Pearl Harbor so many years ago, just about 2,600. They say the casualties from this one are going to be so much worse. They are ready to go to war. There is a sense of war here at the Pentagon. And thank you very much, John McCarthy at the Pentagon. We'll be coming back to you many times in the course of the evening. The question is, go to war with whom? Uh, because uh, from the FBI, from the CIA, from the Pentagon today, no warning of this whatsoever, no knowledge of who's involved, no clues yet as to who's involved that we have heard about in any respect today. It has been interesting today to try to focus on the president, too, because the country does so clearly focus, I can't read that, I'm sorry, does focus on the president in a moment like this for leadership. And I believe that Ann Compton, who's been with the president all day in a very tight group of people with the president, is on Air Force One and can talk to us at the moment. Annie, can you hear me? Yes, Peter, I can. We're just getting off of Air Force One. He has arrived back in Washington with a dramatic flight with F-16s and F-15s on either wing as he came into Andrews Air Force Base. And the president feels it's important to address the nation tonight. Later this evening, he will give what we are told is a message of reassurance to Americans that the United States has been tested before and has always passed those tests. And uh, when we saw him briefly toward the back of the plane, he was resolute. Annie, thank you very much. And the president will take a helicopter, I gather, from Andrews Air Force Base um, downtown, or do we know that? Well, we do know that, but it's one of the things we aren't going to talk about until he's safely at home. Well, we just did, inadvertently, <laughs> and, and as we had not been told not to talk about it. But there was yeah. some question. The president does traditionally come from Andrews Air Force Base down, and one assumes given the extraordinary security that's uh, surrounded the president today and how the Secret Service has moved him first from Florida and then out to Nebraska and now to, to Louisiana, first of all, then to Nebraska and back to Washington, president all over the country. Here's the Secretary of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, who's been in the Pentagon all day. And we're having difficulty hearing him, and one should not be surprised if there isn't some kind of, if there's some kind of hookup that didn't work today. Very, very rarely today have we had a problem. So we'll have our reporter on the scene listen to this, and the moment that we can hear him, we will go back to him. But in the meantime, Claire Shipman is just outside the, uh, the White House across Lafayette Square. Claire, I want to check in quickly with you, if I may, to know that if we know anything about the President's plans for this evening, that we, in some respects, haven't had on the air today or go beyond what Anne's reporting is. Well, what we do know is that we're told by sources who've been with the president today that he is extremely upset, of course, about what has happened, but agitated and angry. Somebody told us that the language he will use tonight will be retaliatory. He will express his impatience. In other words, he will say there won't be a long time spent thinking about how to act once Claire, the U.S. is confident. I apologize. I wouldn't interrupt you if sure. you couldn't go back to Mr. Rumsfeld, Secretary of Defense. Well, the best laid plans. First of all, oh, here we are. Kind enough to uh, come down and has been with us. Uh, we've very recently had a discussion with the President of the United States. Uh, Chairman Hugh Shelton has just landed from Europe. Um, Secretary of the Army, Tom White, who has a, a responsibility for incidents like this. Uh, as executive agent for the Department of Defense is also joining me. Uh, it's an indication that the United States government is functioning in the face of this terrible act uh, against our country. 
I should add that the briefing here is taking place in the Pentagon. The Pentagon's functioning. It'll be in business tomorrow. I know the interest in casualty figures, and all I can say is it's not possible to have solid casualty fi figures uh, at this time. And uh, the various components are doing roster checks, and we'll have uh, information at some point in the future, and as quickly as it's possible to have it, it will certainly be made available to each of you. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions after uh, asking uh, First General Shelton uh, if he would like to say anything, and then we will allow the others to make a remark or two. General Shelton, Thank you, outgoing Secretary. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs. Ladies and gentlemen, as the Secretary just said, today we have watched the tragedy of an outrageous act of barbaric terrorism carried out by fanatics against both civilians and military people. Acts that have killed and maimed many innocent and decent citizens of our country. I extend my condolences to the entire Department of Defense families, military and civilian, and to the families of all those throughout our nation who lost loved ones. I think this is indeed a reminder of the, tragic, the tragedy and the tragic dangers that we face day in and day out, both here at home as well as abroad. I would tell you up front, I have no intentions of discussing today what comes next, but make no mistake about it, your armed forces are ready. Chairman. Chairman of the uh, Senate Armed Services Committee, Carl Levin. Our intense focus on recovery and helping the injured and the families of those who were killed is matched only by our determination to prevent more attacks and matched only by our unity to track down, root out, and relentlessly pursue terrorists, states that support them, and harbor them. They are the common enemy of the civilized world. Our institutions are strong, and our unity is palpable. Senator John Warner. Thank you. As a past chairman uh, preceding Carl Levin, I can assure you that the Congress stands behind our president, and the president speaks with one voice for this entire nation. This is indeed the most tragic hour in America's history, and yet I think it can be its finest hour, as our president and those with him, most notably our Secretary of Defense, our chairman, and the men and women of the armed forces all over this world uh, stand ready not only to defend this nation and our allies against further attack, but to take such actions as are directed in the future in retaliation for this terrorist act, a series of terrorist acts unprecedented in world history. We call upon the entire world to step up and help because terrorism is a common enemy to all, and we're in this together. The United States has borne the brunt, but who can be next? Step forward and let us hold accountable and punish those that have perpetrated this attack. Again, I commend the Secretary, the Chairman, and how proud we are. We spoke with our President here moments ago. He's got a firm grip on this situation. And the Secretary and the General have a firm grip on our armed forces and in communication of the, the world over. The Secretary of Defense, uh, Carl much. Levin, Senator we'll Democratic Senator Carl Levin. Are they uh, going to take questions? Let's stay we'll here with adjourn. this and see if, we, if, if anything sure. is revealed. Mr. Secretary, did you have any inkling at all, in any way, that something of this nature and something of this scope might be planned? Uh, Charlie, we, we don't discuss intelligence matters. I see. And, how, and how, how would you respond if you find out who did this? The, uh, obviously, the President of the United States has spoken on that subject, and those are issues that he will address in good time. Mr. Yes. Secretary, we are getting reports uh, from CNN and others that there are bombs exploding in Kabul, Afghanistan. 
Are we at the moment striking back, and if so, is the target Osama bin Laden and his organization? I've seen those reports. Uh, they, in no way, is the United States government connected to those explosions. What about Osama bin Laden? Do you suspect him as the prime suspect in this? Um, it's 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 not the time for discussions like that. Mr. Secretary, you said you could not be specific about casualties. Can you give us some characterization of whether it's dozens or hundreds in the, in the building? Well, we know there were large number, many dozens in the aircraft that flew at full power, uh, steering directly into the between I think the first and second floor of the uh, uh, opposite the helipad. Uh, you've seen it. Uh, it, there, there cannot be any survivors. It, it just would be beyond comprehension. The, um, there are a number of people that they've uh, not identified by name, but identified as being uh, dead, and uh, there are a number of casualties. But uh, we're, the FBI has secured the site, and the um, Information takes time to come. People have been uh, lifted out and taken away in ambulances, and uh, the the numbers will be calculated, and it will not be a few. Mr. Secretary, could you tell us what yes. you saw? Mr. Secretary, do you consider what happened today, both in New York and here, an act of war? There is no question but that the attack against the United States of America today was... A, 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 a vicious, a well-coordinated, um, massive attack against the United States of America. Um, what words the lawyers will use to characterize it uh, is for them. Is this the Secretary that mean of Defense, Don Rumsfeld, being asked all the obvious questions, and let's just quickly review them before we move. Did they have any inkling of this in advance? The answer is they don't discuss this. Every single piece of evidence we have seen all day says the United States in, in no way had any inkling of what was going to happen. And if they did, boy, somebody missed something somewhere. Uh, Secretary, reaffirming what we reported to you already, the U.S. has no, or saying again what we've said already, that the U.S. has no involvement in Afghanistan, uh, the violence occurring in Kabul tonight. This is not a time to discuss or whether or not the United States suspects Osama bin Laden, but he's been at the top of the list of American suspects for international acts of, acts of international terrorism for so long now it's impossible not to imagine he wouldn't be at the top casualties in the building he says there are many and then he goes on to make the point that we sometimes forget in covering New York and the Pentagon today and that is the people who died on the aircraft 266 people died on on three aircraft today a four aircraft today the two that crashed into the Trade Towers the one that crashed into the Pentagon uh, and <clears throat> the one that crashed uh, in Pennsylvania today, whether or not it was on a mission or not. Was this an act of war? Secretary of Defense and everybody else in the government today, uh, you can expect to be very careful about using the phrase an act of war because it imposes on the United States um, certain requirements to respond in certain ways if they find themselves involved in a war, especially with, with another country. We believe this is now the President coming from uh, Andrews Air Force Bay to the White House, but it was Senator John Warner, one of the most senior politicians involved with the military for many, many years in that year now, and a man with a real sense of history and knowledge of history, surely, who describes this as the most tragic hour in America's history. I think there will be people, not least of whom are historians throughout the country, will, will argue with the senator about that today, given the attack on Pearl Harbor, given the invasion of Normandy and heavens knows given the first and most tragic days of the of the Civil War in 1861 who will argue with that characterization but it does give you some real sense at the moment of how intense the feeling is not only in the political establishment in the country as a whole as well and all sorts of other countries I'm getting messages from countries all day today people deeply profoundly shaken uh, by the experience that the United States has had today. I want to go to Washington now because Claire Shipman is there right opposite the White House. We'll come back to Charlie Gibson and casualties in just a moment, but as we think, Claire, that the President may indeed be arriving, are those helicopters, Air Force or Marine One as it's called, the President's helicopter coming from Andrews Air Force Base? Uh, yes, that's right, Peter, and in fact we're told the only reason that his security team felt comfortable letting him chopper back to the White House was because there is substantial air cover 
in the area, uh, keeping him protected. But it has been a, a long day for him, as you noted, and he has, we're told from people who were with him, wanted to get back to the White House all day, but again was listening very closely to his security team who wanted to be absolutely certain that that was going to be all right. Um, we were talking earlier, the president is very eager to make plain tonight that his mood is retaliatory to express impatience. We got a little bit of a hint of that from a statement from Ari Fleischer, his press secretary today, who said um, not so long ago, we will find these people and they will suffer the consequences of taking on this nation. I wouldn't be surprised to hear something like that from the president tonight. Equally eager to get back, Peter, uh, just as the president is back, congressional leaders, they're planning to make a public statement tonight at 7.30 p.m. Again, everybody wanting to show this is business as usual in Washington, certainly not usual in the way we, we would ever define it, but they want to show a government that is up and functioning because they think that the PR element here, in terms of sending a message around the world, is every bit as important as security measures. As we wait, I'm going to spring in the voice of Charlie Gibson at the moment because I do not want to go away from this scene on what I assume is the south lawn of the White House. Um, we'll just stay with this and watch the president come up. But Charlie, you've been trying to get some kind of handle on casualties throughout the day. Have you had any success? Well, no, Peter. People want a number. Mm -hmm. And uh, as if it were some way to quantify these most horrific of acts and properly no one has been willing to speculate on what that number may be obviously any low number would have to be ratcheted up at some point and to give upper end estimates are probably too horrible to imagine as the mayor of new york rudolph giuliani said when we get the final number it will be more than we can bear um, the concern obviously is that there were emergency workers inside the world trade centers when they collapsed when the twin towers came down and the evacuations had not been completed and as the secretary of defense said a moment ago when we get the totals from the pentagon it will be a lot more than a few uh, we do have some estimates on injured but again these are highly unreliable the mayor again saying at least 2100 injured in new york 1500 taken to liberty state park across the hudson river in new jersey 600 taken to hospitals and the most chilling one of the most chilling quotes that we've heard today, St. Vincent's Hospital here in New York had more than 200 injured. One doctor, Stephen Stern, saying there are hundreds of people burned head to toe. And we know many burn victims have been evacuated, some as far away as being taken to Canada, some being flown to Vanderbilt Hospital in Nashville. Uh, the military apparently flying those burn victims out. Thanks, Tommy. There he is, the president coming back from a trip that has taken him first to Florida today to talk about education when ironically the political establishment in Washington wanted to talk about federal budget and keeping the country out of recession. And then this happened just as the president was visiting a group of people. He learned about it, spoke to the people, then moved on to Louisiana and then out to Nebraska, uh, where he went into a bunker totally reminiscent of the situation which the president might have found himself in and which the country prepared for during the Cold War when the issue was nuclear exchange between the United States and the Soviet Union. And now, after something of a sharp debate, we gather, between the president's political staff and between the Secret Service, the president is coming home uh, to the White House. There's, no, there's nothing <clears throat> that this president, this new and young president, could ever have imagined was going to occur on his watch, which would test his leadership qualities so. And he is going, and, 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 how, he, and how he responds, how he accommodates the country's frustration and how he accommodates uh, the country's uh, anxiety and anger and how he responds or finds a way to respond and as we've said many times to whom uh, will mark George Bush however it goes one way or the other as he to speak to the nation at nine o'clock tonight and the as Claire Shipman said to us the representatives of the Congress who've been pretty forthright today earlier Senator Biden early today saying the Congress must be seen to keep going that the most important thing is that terrorists not be, see, not be allowed to see that American life has been interrupted to any greater extent than it already has today. So we're going to hear in full later tonight, but we shall be on the air for the entire time for any development. Lisa Stark, who covers aviation for us on a full-time basis from Washington, uh, is in Seattle today, among other things, the headquarters of the Boeing company, which had its aircraft involved in these 
hijackings today, 757 and a 767. What can you tell us, Lisa? Well, Peter, it now appears uh, that, it, that the weapon of choice appears to have been knives on board these planes. We know from uh, reports from our sources and others that reports from flight attendants on an American flight and from two passengers, from passengers on two different flights we're now learning, uh, the United flight that went into the World Trade Tower as well as the flight that went into the Pentagon, cell phone calls from passengers on both those flights reported that uh, men were on board with knives or box cutters, uh, that flight attendants had been injured or killed, uh, that people had stormed the cockpit. We also learned that on one of the flights, the American Airlines flight that went into the World Trade Tower, the flight attendant was also able to tell the American Airlines Operations Center, she reached them and told them what was going on board. She was able to tell them the actual seat number of the passenger who was causing the problems on the plane. So that may lead authorities at least to one name, at least the name of the person who booked that ticket. She was able to give that information uh, to the people at American Airlines. Obviously, this was a major security breach at, at, least at three U.S. airports. There will be a lot of talk, as there is already, about how this could possibly have happened. Uh, one person told me these are obviously shocking events, but not that surprising. There have been a number of reports throughout the years about security problems at U.S. airports, the Department of Transportation Inspector General, uh, the GAO, all of those uh, groups have done reports talking about how easy it is to penetrate secure areas, to get on airplanes, how easy it is to get devices past the people who are checking you at the screening machines. So obviously uh, this will be a focus of the investigation to find out how these people got on board and how the weapons got on board as well. Peter? Lisa Stark, who is in, uh, in Seattle uh, for us tonight, and gives us uh, one additional piece of information I think we have not had earlier today, which was that one of the people on board the American Airlines flight that uh, was, I think she said, the first. Lisa, are you still there? Lisa Stark's still there. I think she said was the first flight, or the first aircraft today, which run into, a, into the trade towers, that somebody on board did manage to give some security operators at American Airlines headquarters the number of a seat in which one of the hijackers or terrorists was occupying. Am I correct in that, correct. Lisa? That, that was the American Airlines mm. Flight 11. It was the one that went into, the one of the two that went into the World Trade Tower. The flight attendant was able to tell American Airlines operations the actual, identified the actual seat number of the person involved in the hijacking. So that may help authorities. And Peter, I want to add one other thing. I did manage to talk to a number of controllers in the New York area today. Uh, they told me that they uh, realized by the time the second plane was heading to the World Trade Tower what was going to happen. They said they had a helpless feeling. All they could do was watch the blip on the screen. At that point, of course, there was nothing that they could do. OK, thanks very much. Lisa Stark in Seattle <coughs> tonight, the headquarters of the Boeing Company or at least part of the headquarters of the Boeing Company, and they moved to Chicago. But there's three airports, three major, major uh, violations of security or breaches of security, to be fair, um, at Dulles Airport, just outside Washington, at Boston. And as somebody pointed earlier, it could have been any number of flights leaving from Boston today. And at Newark Airport, a flight headed for uh, the West Coast as well, all three of which, given the fact that they were going to be transcontinental flights, would have had huge amounts of fuel on board. It was John Miller who first brought us that piece of information. And John, you, I don't think anybody's been in quite as close touch as you have with uh, the cops, the firefighters here in New York City today. As we get to this point, a little more than 10 hours after this incident, what, what do you, not your conclusion, what's your interim conclusion of where we're at? Well, three things are happening. Uh, one, the very basics. The FBI has activated its command post in New York and set up, uh, well, an FBI slang, it's a lead bucket. Uh, as all leads come in, they're entered into computers and agents are assigned to go out and check them out. This covers everything from crazy crank calls about people who suspect people to uh, leads from people with direct information. They, uh, they have set up a toll-free number that they're working on getting the, the telephone number for. We don't have it yet um, for national leads to come in. Ironically, it won't be in New York. It's going to come into the Atlanta field office because they literally are buried under phone calls and, and, and business in New York. So they've tasked that field office to sort through these phone calls in the coming days.
fire.